Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Robert Higgs, Senior Fellow in Political Economy at the Independent Institute, editor at large of the Independent Review, and author of many books, including the libertarian classic Crisis and Leviathan. His new book is Taking a Stand Reflections on Life, Liberty, and the Economy. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Thank you very much. So I'd like to start with your background in history, particularly how do you came to libertarianism both in the ideas and then to become a professional libertarian. Was this something you were just born into or <laughs> did you have a moment of revelation when you were 18 or something? Uh, I would have to speculate on the remote origins of, of uh, my inclination toward libertarianism. I, I was not brought up in a political household and uh, was not especially interested in politics uh, even when I was in college, although I was interested in certain things uh, at the time. Uh, I think I might actually date uh, my movement in that direction to – to when I was 17, uh, I went to the uh, U.S. Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut. And uh, that was a very rigorous place, especially in those days. Uh, there was you know, constant harassment and physical and psychological uh, uh, pressure being put on people constantly. So the idea was to drive away or break people who couldn't take the pressure. So there was a kind of method in the madness, but uh, – but one of the things I learned there is that <clears throat> in a situation like that where there are superiors and inferiors in a chain of command, some of the superiors will abuse their their power. And uh, I think that is a, an insight that stuck with me from then on for the rest of my life. You, you give people power, even petty power, at your peril. And uh, there are people who enjoy abusing those who can be abused. And uh, I think that sensibility uh, was important to me as, as my political thinking developed, which, which happened during the 1960s. I, I didn't fancy myself a libertarian. If anything, when I was in college, I, I thought of myself as a new leftist, uh, which wasn't all bad. Um, and I was – always opposed to the Vietnam War, even when most Americans didn't know it was happening. Uh, so that was a big influence on me too because that taught me that the government is capable of routinely committing horrible crimes for years on end for the slightest political motives. Uh, and uh, – did you read any authors around that time that helped you out? Well, I used to read Ramparts magazine. That was uh, probably the the only kind of ideological reading I did consistently. But I dabbled in leftist uh, books of various sorts. I I read some Marx and and uh, some of the contemporary leftists. Uh, I became enamored actually of C. Wright Mills. And uh, to this day, I, I actually defend Mills in many ways. I think uh, Mills was an honest scholar uh, and, uh, of course, he didn't have a decent understanding of economics and would have benefited greatly from having one. But, but despite that, uh, C. Wright Mills, I think, uh, continues to be someone one can, can learn from. Um, and particularly his analysis of elites uh, in the, his book, The Power Elite and others. He, he also wrote a, a book called The Sociological Imagination, uh, which has some really excellent uh, advice to young scholars. You know, how do you go about your work with integrity? Uh, just how do you do the nuts and bolts of it? You know, what are you trying to do? Which uh, was basically tell the truth. I'm curious how this notion that you picked up that people in power will abuse that power led to specifically libertarianism and a skepticism about 
state power because one of the things that we often hear, especially from those on the left, is that that very idea that if people have power, they're going to abuse it, the, the big guys are going to beat down little guys, is what makes them want to embrace the state even more because they see the state as the way to correct that, that you know, the bosses or the, the warlords or the strongest guy in an anarchic world or whatever is going to beat up the little guy or take advantage of him or force him to work long hours for low pay. And so we need the state to be the protector of the little guy, the protector of the common man. Well, I was not completely immune to the, those kinds of thoughts uh, by any means, but I, I was saved from going too far down that path by the fact that I was studying economics. Uh, I think you know if if you wanted to identify one overwhelmingly fatal flaw in the thinking of nearly all leftists, it's that they don't have a clue about economics. And the more I learned about economics, especially after I got into graduate school, uh, the more I understood the importance of markets and the benefits of markets and, and even the relationship between markets and freedom in general. And uh, so by the time I got my Ph.D., which was in 1968, I, I certainly didn't consider myself a conservative. Not, never in my life did I consider myself a conservative. But but I still thought of myself as a person more on the left uh, than anywhere else. But after I went to work as a professor at the University of Washington, they kicked that out of me pretty quickly. And, uh, and at the same time, the, I, sometime in that first year of my teaching career, uh, I, I stumbled across Hayek and, and, and just loved Hayek. Uh, uh, the first thing I read by him was, was his great 1945 article, on Use of Knowledge in Society. And at the time, I thought, oh, well, that's you know, a really good article. I can use that for my students because there's no math in it. Everybody can understand this, but I, I didn't really understand it myself because being trained as a neoclassical economist, I was thinking that it's a lot like what I learned from Stiegler and other Chicagoans about the economics of information. So I, I still had a, a lot of understanding to, to arrive at, uh, but it led me to have a, have a high opinion of Hayek. And, and so the next thing I did was to read the Constitution of Liberty which to me was a, a, a very important book. Uh, now when I look back at it, I, all I can see are all the concessions that Hayek is making, you know, one after another, uh, and why some people call him a socialist and all that. But at the time, he seemed like just a perfect classical liberal, and, and, and he impressed me with his scholarship. That's what won me over. Hayek, Hayek was this, you know, this great old-fashioned European scholar who knew a lot of languages and he knew about philosophy and law and, and he wasn't anything like the economists I, would, I had read in my education. You know? <laughs> he was the real deal as a thinker. And, uh, and so that kind of tipped me over into classical liberalism very early. And from that point on, I, I think I just gradually evolved in the direction of being a more and more uh, unforgiving classical liberal. Uh, and late in the 70s, again because of Hayek's having cited Mises, I read Human Action from cover to cover. And I would say that was the only kind of epiphany experience of my whole life as a scholar. That really hit me very hard uh, and actually made me think that I, despite the success I'd been having in mainstream economics, it made me think that uh, that everything I'd written was just garbage. <laughs> I, want to, uh, I want to ask you about one of those things <laughs> you wrote about around that time because mm. uh, it's, it's, it's my favorite book of yours. Uh, in 77, it was published, uh, The Comp Competition and Coercion, Blacks in the American Economy, 1865 to 1914, which is uh, definitely in that old I – mean, Old style economics, full, full of graphs and and numbers. But what was the what were your general thesis? What did you generally find in that book? Well, the uh, the book aimed to, as it were, um, change the emphasis. Uh, practically everything written in Black history uh, took the view that blacks had been victimized from A to Z at every point in history. 
it's almost uh, a case of what my old colleague Morris Morris uh, used to call the uh, the theory of infinite and increasing misery. You know, they start on slavery <laughs> and then it gets worse every year, notwithstanding their emancipation or anything else. And that 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 was just so counterfactual that nobody who respected evidence could could accept it. And I didn't uh, when I started reading Black History. But uh, what I tried to do in that book, uh, first as a result of some research I did on particular issues about land tenure and land ownership and uh, occupational distributions and migration and so forth, uh, I, I built up a, a body of analysis and a set of facts that, that led me to believe that that not only were were blacks not – 100 percent victimized, but despite everything working against them, and there was a tremendous amount working against them, they actually succeeded by virtue of their own efforts and by virtue of the fact that there was competition for their services. And that's why the book is titled Competition and Coercion, because competition, and, and I'd learned this from Gary Becker's work and other work in the just the mainstream uh, economics of discrimination. Competition is the salvation of oppressed people. Uh, and that can be seen in the, any case. You know, Pick your ethnic group and you see the same phenomena operating. Uh, if people have something valuable, and certainly black labor was valuable, as, and some blacks had skills uh, beyond labor power, uh, there, there's going to be potential for someone to, to bid away an exploited worker, a worker who's being paid less than the value of his mar marginal contribution to, uh, to output. And so in a way, my book was infused by pursuit of that theme uh, and included ultimately some attempts to estimate what had happened to black income levels between the late 60s and 1860s and uh, – World War One, um, approximately, and I found that you know, black income, on average, was was growing faster than white income was growing. That was a period of very rapid economic growth in general. But because blacks had started at such a relatively low level, uh, even if we if we go you know oh, fifty years time, they've only improved from about twenty five percent of the white income level to to thirty five or forty percent of the white level. But that's not trivial. That's a lot of improvement and I and I collected a lot of evidence uh, that demonstrated just in concrete ways how their uh, living conditions had improved, you know, what kinds of things they might have in their home, uh, what kinds of clothing and food and uh, entertainment and, and what have you. They, they had access to, by the end of that period, typically, that they had not had access to at the beginning of that period. I mean, the, the immediate post-war period was horrible in, in every way uh, because of all the disruptions of the war and all the destruction that had taken place in the South where 90 percent of the blacks lived and continued to live throughout the next 50 years. But, you, would competition in the market have done – I mean, do you think it did better for blacks in that period than – Attempts by governments to alleviate or fix these problems, whether I mean, so we had the problem with separate but equal, for mm -hmm. example, which is mm -hmm. a very anti-competitive. Yes, that it, when Plessy v. Ferguson came down, it was you were saying you had to have segregated rail cars, or yes. you were allowed to, but that meant the rail companies had to have two rail cars that mm -hmm. were half full as opposed to one that was full, right. which would which didn't seem to really the businesses themselves in the market were not as into discrimination as perhaps the government was. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. That was another part of my thesis that uh, whereas competition in the market was their salvation to the extent that they had salvation, um, whenever they encountered the, the government and in, in their case, it was at the state and, and especially the local level where they made these encounters, they, they were totally out of luck then. The only hope they had in their encounters with the government – was the uh, the protection they could get from a powerful white patron. So a, a system developed in the South, particularly in the plantation areas where uh, 
blacks became you know beholden to plantation owners or business owners uh, for protection from the state and and you know if they were arrested their patron would go in and pay their fine uh, if they were you know about, about to be sentenced to jail or something the guy would go in and talk to the judge and and in, in all sorts of ways there was an, a trade going on this was a market phenomenon this uh, paternalism. Uh, there was a trade going on. Uh, the blacks provided faithful services. You know, they, they didn't run away the first time they were unhappy about something. Uh, in exchange, they got the protection from the official discriminators that, that stood ready to squash any black at any time. How much does competition alleviate these discrimination based on race if – I guess the discriminators gain utility from the racism. So they, you know, they like not hiring blacks or they would – they really don't want to hire them because they don't want to be around them or the rail cars like, yes, we could have integrated the rail cars but then the white customers might not have been willing to pay as much or wouldn't have patronized the service. Well, it, it continues to operate and can operate uh, with great power so long as they're – are enough people who value wealth more than the exercise of discrimination, and in, in the in the South, you know, between the war of, between the states and the First World War, there were plenty of people who preferred wealth to the pleasures of discrimination, <laughs> and especially these wealthy people. Uh, you know, the the blacks were hated more by working class, lower class whites. Uh, Wealthy people didn't fear blacks. You know, they were they were so far removed from them by class status and wealth that they didn't see the blacks as any threat to them at all. They they weren't hankering to to hurt blacks in the same way that uh, that lower class whites were. Sounds a lot like our a lot of anti-immigrant rhetoric today. Yeah. Well, also especially if those lower class whites were unionized, and then it got really bad for African Americans. Uh, uh, yeah, many of the unions that were formed, and of course in the South there wasn't as much unionization as in other parts of the country. But uh, where unions were formed, uh, they usually did uh, either discriminate against blacks or simply exclude blacks from employment. So unionization was definitely a negative, <laughs> big negative factor, but but not one that affected most black workers because there th was not enough unionization in the whole economy. There's more in the North, yeah. After the Great Migration, uh, David Bernstein's Only One Place of Redress is a yes, great book about that. Right. But I wanted to ask about uh, another book, uh, the one I had mentioned at the at the introduction, uh, Crisis and Leviathan. I probably your most known book. Um, and for those who haven't read it, uh, definitely if you're a fan of this podcast or libertarianism in general, you have to read it. Can you give us an overview of, of what you what you looked for in Crisis of Leviathan and what you found? Well, that book was uh, uh, aimed at uh, tracking the growth of government, especially the federal government from the late 19th century up to the time it was written in the 1980s. And uh, at that time uh, – the growth of government had become a kind of cottage industry among economists and to some extent uh, among political scientists and people were um, people were applying various theories that uh, were lying around in economics or that they they devised for themselves to to account for why government got so much bigger in that century and uh, I didn't have a great interest in that when I first started my career, but my colleague Douglas North, uh, who was the department chairman and the man who hired me, and a future Nobel Prize uh, winner, well, that, that yes. future at that time, uh, Doug, <laughs> Doug was viewed as you know the expert on government uh, economic relations among. U.S. economic historians, and so he was constantly writing about this and talking about it, and uh, and uh, we all worked together. The economic historians, especially, uh, read each other's papers. I was in his office practically every day just to to talk about economic history, and so I talked to him a lot. And in my own teaching of U.S. economic history courses, 
I dealt with that subject. But I wasn't doing research in that area. But I was getting more and more, in a sense, uh, frustrated by my inability to persuade Doug of certain things, <laughs> uh, particularly that ideology had been very important in this process, ideological change, uh, and also that the national emergency periods, especially the world wars, had been critical times for the growth of government. Uh, neither element had at that time uh, become important in Doug's thinking. Uh, so by the early 80s, you know, by 1980, 81, I decided, well, I think I'll write a book on this. And my idea was just to write about basically the two world wars and the Great Depression because that's where the main action was uh, for these crises. But when I started writing and started going around giving talks at other universities, uh, one of the questions that often came up was, well, you know, there were crises at earlier times in history. Why didn't they produce this ratchet effect you're telling us was produced by uh, by the the wars and the depression? And uh, and that led me to decide that I needed to have a chapter on progressivism because I'd come to believe that it was that ideological watershed of progressivism that created a, uh, a condition wherein there would be a ratchet effect. You have to have people predisposed to think that when there's an emergency, government should jump in with all four feet. And that had not existed in the 19th century. It's not that nobody wanted government to come in and you know, hand rents to them or do favors for them. That's always been the case. But in the 19th century, there was a kind of dominant ideological belief that that government should be limited. It, it, or at least the federal government. Or is it cer the federal certainly government? the federal government should be. But even at the state and local level, there was a belief that politicians were crooked, that they wasted people's money, that, that they were always you know, engaging in boondoggles, especially after what happened in the 1830s and early 40s with all the bankruptcies of states and their canal projects that went belly up and – and that led to a bunch of constitutional revisions and so forth. So from then on especially, there was a, a, a lot of thinking among opinion leaders and uh, you know, lawyers and writers and what have you that, 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 that government was simply you know, a, a factor that while people didn't want to get rid of it, they wanted to have government for kind of classical liberal reasons. They thought it, should, it had to be kept small. It had to be kept limited or – uh, it would abuse its powers or, or waste a lot of people's money. Uh, and and uh, progressivism altered that as the default ideological background condition. And as a result, it meant that the next time there was a pretext for a great increase in government action, as during World War I, uh, then many people were predisposed to to favor, well, let's have the government do this. Let's have it do that. Uh, if you know, if we have to have a big bunch of ships built by the government to fight the war, why don't we have the government build housing for the shipyard workers? Uh, and it just went on and on. There was always some connection whereby some immediate pretext like fighting the war could be hooked onto some other government activity. And so when the government started buying a lot of certain raw materials to produce munitions, well, the next thing you know is that it bids up the prices of, of, of copper and leather and, and burlap and various raw commodities. And there, then that creates pressure because people who use those commodities in their own businesses, they, their costs are being driven up. And then that creates pressure for government to use price controls. And so in World War I, you ended up not with comprehensive price controls but with selective price controls on these specific items whose prices had been driven up by government's own purchases on a large scale. And you just see this kind of thing again and again and again. And it's because nobody was stopping to say, look, this is a bad idea for government to, to create a shipping board 
uh, to regulate ocean shipping rates and, and working conditions of sailors, that's a bad idea. You know, we should let markets take care of those things because by the time this was done in 1916, opinion leaders thought, oh, that's a good idea. You know, we, we, we've got railroad regulation, ship that's very similar, and now shipping rates have been driven up because, you know, the British Navy's driven from the seas. And it's uh, very expensive for Americans to ship goods to Latin America or to bring raw materials from from there and other places. And and so people who had to incur shipping rates were screaming for some kind of relief. And 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 on and on and on. And it just went on and on. Everyone had a a similar element like that, which – which required that there be a predisposition to use government in a way it had never been used before. So how intentional was this ratchet effect in the sense that – so the way you've described it, it sounds almost like government grew but people didn't set out to grow government. They might have a predisposition to say like, okay, so government undertook this activity and that activity had negative effects somewhere else and so, well, we screwed that area up so we should go and fix it and you had people who naturally thought that government would be better at fixing it than markets so that's what we ought to do and then that leads to this ongoing ratchet. But was there an intentional element going on behind it either like within government, like people saying here, this crisis is an opportunity to grow our power or the power of government, let's do it or people outside of government saying this crisis and the things it's leading to are a way for me to use government to benefit myself? Both. Uh, there was some of each. And uh, even when uh, people uh, entered into these uh, expanded government activities uh, as a simple reaction to the immediate problem at hand, uh, they quickly realized that they might have a good deal here. And so later on, they defended its continuation uh, or perhaps even its enlargement. Uh, You had, for example, after the War Industries Board uh, set priorities for uh, for purchases of different uh, materials the government was using so that the government's contractors got the top claim on copper or steel or leather or whatever it was. Uh, that system of priority uh, was something that a lot of businesses like. They thought after the war, oh, we should keep this. We should have somebody regulating industry because, you know, before we had all these dreadful price wars and and uh, companies would have – Destructive competition, Yeah, right? destructive competition. I it, made it, scare quotes on that if anyone it, couldn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> Always a lot of big businesses complaining about destructive competition you know, because uh, the – uh, incumbents like things the way they are. They want to be the producers. They don't want to have to be fighting off entrants all the time. So if there's a regulator, you know, particularly if they're the guys doing the regulation, they can take care of this. You know, they can they can uh, normalize everything. You know, they can uh, they can get rid of uncertainty and <laughs> destructive competition, all the rest of it. But uh, well, that's sort of one of your – the sort of I think at that point with Crisis and Leviathan, which is really interesting because it, it, the first line of the book uh, – this is uh, – maybe this was um, because it was Oxford Press or – but the first line of the book in part one is – and this is interesting for now because you kind of went into sociology of the state. I mean that's mm-hmm. a lot of what you kind of have right. ended up doing. How – what is the mindset of people in government? What are the mindset of people who work with government? What are they trying to achieve? But I think maybe that started with Crisis Leviathan. But the first line is, we must have government. Only government can form certain tasks successfully, and, which is an interesting uh, – uh, I'm not sure if you believe that now, uh, but, but then yeah. you did, it seems, seemingly. Well, uh, when I wrote that, I believed it in the usual way that it was taken. I still believed we, we had to have government – as I say, government as we know it, you know, governments as they really are in the world, coercive, imposed, uh, mean, <laughs> uh, you know, you don't have any choice about this. Governments, we're the government and you're not. Do what we say. Uh, I continue to believe we must have government uh, to do a variety of things, to keep social order, to suppress criminal behavior and uh, – to adjudicate disputes and for a variety of reasons. But I do not believe that we must 
have government as we know it. We don't have to have coercive, imposed government. And uh, I'm satisfied at this point that uh, that it, it is quite possible to have non-coercive means of carrying out all the functions that really need to be carried out to have an orderly and prosperous society. That conclusion was a long time coming for me. Uh, when I wrote Crisis and Leviathan, I was still very much a classical liberal, uh, still very much a neoclassical economist. And uh, those things gradually changed and I became more radical over time. Did that shift result from just a lessening of practical concerns? So, you know, when you say wrote that sentence, the the thought that we must have government as we know it was because the alternative, well, it would be better from a moral perspective, might not work. Or did you have a shift in moral reasoning that just said that, you know, I now think that it's totally morally impermissible to have this sort of course of government? Well, when I wrote that line, I wasn't even thinking about moral issues. I was thinking as an economist, I was thinking what will work. And like almost everybody else, I thought anarchy won't work. <laughs> you know, obviously, that's out. And you know, I followed up that sentence uh, in the same paragraph with a wonderful quotation from, from Mises, uh, who's explaining that Government is not a bad thing. It's actually the most wonderful institution human beings have ever devised. <laughs> and uh, that's that, that's the opposite of what I now believe. But uh, <laughs> what, what caused my thinking to change over the years was, was not so much learning more about the literature of anarchy or, or, or a changing moral position, although I, I did make moral changes, but – it was simply that the more I learned about government as we know it, government as it actually is, the more horrified I became to see government as it really is with your eyes open is something that I found appalling. I, it just seemed more and more outrageous to me that these people who had a sign over their house saying government were permitted, allowed to commit criminal acts right and left, to, to their very existence depended on criminality. Uh, and everybody just took this for granted as if the, there's no problem here. Not only is there no problem, but as Mises said, it's the greatest thing that ever happened. And uh, and so eventually the, the, the moral outrage and the analytical change of understanding that uh, I acquired – join forces to me to uh, to bring me to a position where I'm just astonished that people put up with what they put up with. Well, you – shortly before we recorded this, you were giving a talk here at Cato on your book and during that you mentioned that things are actually a lot worse. So things in Washington, things with the government are a lot worse than – most people even think and most people tend to think no matter what – where they are in the political spectrum that things aren't great. Yeah. Um, so how are they worse? And then relatedly when you talk about you know, that people seem to be OK with this, how much do people know about how bad these things mm -hmm. are? Uh, well, I think they're, they're very much worse than, than most people think or understand. Um, as I say, if you if you had a microphone in everybody's office and the way you had in Nixon's office, this would be a revolutionary <laughs> uh, news item for people. You know, if they knew what these guys are actually saying and doing. Uh, well, there's one thing I've always loved about the FBI, which is their sting operations against politicians. <laughs> they set these up so elaborately so that they get just ironclad film, audio, you know, documentary <laughs> evidence so that they get these bastards just nailed to the wall. You know, they can't possibly say they're innocent. And I just love it when these guys are revealed. But the th trouble is, you know, you can't do a sting on every single politician on earth. Uh, and as for the second part of your your question, I think most people know practically nothing 
about what really goes on in politics. They, they, they watch the news. They hear politicians give speeches. Uh, that's about the extent of it. There are very few people who, who actually study and scrutinize politics at a level where, where they would begin to think about these things. And even those who do usually are overwhelmed by ideology. They start playing with one team or the other. Uh, there's a lot of partisan political affiliation that muddies everybody's water. They begin to think, yeah, these, these progressive politicians are all sleazebags. But, you know, our guys are upright, Christian, God-fearing, mother-loving, you know, apple pie-eating or vice versa. And that, that's just a total waste. You know, that, that just means your understanding is hopeless when you sign up to play for one of these teams. You don't understand that they're, they're both committing the same crimes. They just have a different set of clients. Are the crimes limited to – I mean you talked a lot about politicians and the yes. politicians are up to all this stuff. But one of the things you learn spending time in Washington is how much of the federal government is really out of the politicians' hands. Yes. It's the bureaucrats, the people right. in the agencies who right. dominate so much. Are things as bad there as well? I, I think the politicians themselves are the most crooked. Uh, but Are there any good politicians? You, at this point, do you think that it's possible that anyone got here uh, clean? They got to D.C., you got to federal office? It's conceivable. I'm not going to name any names. <laughs> uh, but then the bureaucrats are another level too. Uh, the, the problem I think is a little different in the bureaucracy. The problem there is, uh, is that uh, these bureaucratic kingpins have a lot of discretion and they have tremendous power and they're pretty much entrenched. It's uh, – you know, you've got to do some pretty outstanding stuff. To, to get yourself removed from power. And so they're pretty confident they can wheel and deal as they as they like. And of course some of them get get bought with you know cash in a plain brown wrapper too. But that I don't think is the typical way in which they're corrupted. They're corrupted by by just the ease with which they're able to exercise power and abuse their power and by being able to think of themselves as really being right of you know the of not even committing crimes but of doing you know good things for people if not all people at least the right people uh, I think they're corrupted by hubris more than they're corrupted by cash uh, the politicians of course they're not immune from hubris by any means but uh, but you know they're they're constantly fighting to collect money to run the next election, and that means cash is really terribly important to them in a way that it's not important to the bureaucrats. Well, how how culpable are should we regard people in government? I mean, of any sort, uh, whether it's DMV person up to a DEA agent, up to someone who you know files papers at the at the EPA should we regard all of them as somewhat culpable in this endeavor or do some of them get a free pass of some sort well yeah at a philosophical level if if you work for government you're culpable you're you're living on on stolen property but i don't i don't see any point in saying the janitor who you know cleans the offices in the department of agriculture is a, is a big criminal uh, and of course, a lot of the clerks and workaday drones in these bureaus—they don't have anything much to do with policy at all. They're just shuffling papers. Uh, that doesn't mean they don't abuse people. Uh, they run into, you know, even the guy at the welfare office. He can he can give some grief to the poor SOBs that go in there trying to get a month month's worth of groceries, but. Uh, but at the same time, they don't make policy. They don't, you know, set any any rates or or you know rules about how they're going to deal with people. It's the policymakers, people who have some influence over making policy. And and I think too, the a lot of the lawyers that work in the government are, you know, they're basically there 
their job is to put a legal gloss, you know, to throw a legal garment over whatever kind of crimes their bosses want to commit. And that to me is really despicable um, because, you know, um, in theory, a lawyer's highest obligation is to the law and to truth. They all swear to this, you know, that's, but I think, you know, that's kind of laughing stuff. You know, if you had 10 lawyers in a bar, they'd get a good laugh out of that. And certainly if they had anything to do with the criminal justice system, where, where things work almost in the opposite way, you know, where lying is like built into the very tissue of what they do every day. But, uh, but I, and I think the culpability question is not an easy one. It's not a black and white thing. And it's possible that there are even people at very high levels who aren't, you know, who don't deserve to be indicted. Uh, sometimes they uh, they do the honest thing. They resign. Uh, in World War One, you know, when when Colonel House and Company were were wheedling the president toward engagement in the war, uh, William Jennings Bryan was Secretary of State, and. And this, all this pro-British policy and all this Anglophile thinking, and he was appalled by that, you know, because in his his circles, these Brits were not good guys, you know, and the whole idea that the U.S. was going to end up going to save their cookies seemed wrong to him. It wasn't that he was pro-German. He just was pro-peace, and he didn't see a good reason for the U.S. to engage in that war. And and he was right. Uh, but it turned out that, you know, he, he couldn't prevail. So he resigned. And you notice it's extremely rare that anybody in government at a high level ever resigns. Pe- pe- people, you know, can do this, that, and be called uh, all kinds of names and whatever. They just stick it out. They, it's as if they can't stand the idea of living without that power. On that matter of peace, you write in the book – Although I generally eschew quarrels with fellow libertarians over doctrinal matters, I draw the line at the question of war and peace. Yes, because uh, war is, as I call it, the master key. It unlocks every door where your your liberties are protected. It opens everything up to state dictation. Uh, it uh, reduces everyone to the status of, of potential slavery. Uh, you know the fact that that millions of men were were forced into the military. Uh, the state told them, "You have a choice. You can go to prison, where you'll be horribly abused, <laughs> or you can go into the army. Take your pick." And on top of that, of course, there were all the propaganda pressures and the pressures just of. You know, they're friends and relatives and what have you because, you know, the, the country's been bamboozled into this kind of belief in, in the nation state o- over time. And, and so it's not just that the state is out there driving people to, to do what it wants. It, there are plenty of social pressures too. I, I remember when I was young and thinking about what, what if I get drafted? Uh, I certainly wasn't going to go in Vietnam. And, and I wasn't going to go into the army that was fighting in Vietnam either. And so I had to decide. And I decided, you know, I would leave the country if they tried to draft me. But but the main thing I thought about at the time is what effect that would have on my parents. Because I knew that would have a very devastating effect on them. Even though they weren't political people, that was a very unsavory thing. You know, they'd have to face their own friends and neighbors. You know, their son's a draft dodger. Um, so, you know, these pressures are real. There is a society out there that, that you know, by, by a whole variety of means has been molded in, into, into suitable raw material for the rulers. And uh, they don't know it. They think this is all how it ought to be. And, uh, and it's just unfortunate that, that, you know, people don't have greater awareness of the reality of what's being done to them by people who have no right to do it. Is war ever okay though? If people have, say, an individual right to self-defense, don't we have a right to collective defense? You would if every individual had the power to decide if he would participate in that collective effort or not. Then it would be fine. But it's never that way. It's never that way. 
Uh, it wasn't even back in the colonial days when there was militia. You didn't have a choice. Uh, everybody was in the militia if you were able-bodied. Uh, so, you know, I, th- I think uh, the problem when people try to equate the right of self-defense with what governments do when they go to war is that they're just not the same thing. Uh, individual, you know, if you attack me and I, I fight back, yeah, I'm exercising my right of self-defense. But, but you know, if, if, if some guy's running around in, in Yemen and trying to overthrow the government and the U.S. government sends a drone over there and kills him and 50 other people at the same time, that doesn't have a damn thing to do with my self-defense or anybody else's. That's just murder. And... Uh, <laughs> And there's no other gloss you can put on it. It, it, it. People accept this because they haven't thought about it. And, and, and in fact, many people really don't have a well-developed sense of moral thinking or moral reasoning. They just do what is customary or what they've been told or what they're used to. Habit is the worst thing in the world for those of us who try try to build a free society. Because the thing that keeps most people in line is just habit. It's always been this way, and they would have to break away from the way things normally are, get out of line, get themselves in trouble, make enemies. Well, no wonder there's so few mavericks. It's costly to oppose statism in a world infused by statism. A lot of people uh, read your new book – especially like the first section, first 80 pages or so, and also maybe listening to this podcast and we think, oh, well, you know, Professor Hicks is pretty angry. Um, and uh, is that accurate? You also have a great essay in here about called The Power of the State versus The Power of Love. Uh, so is it accurate to say you are angry in some way or, or are you more – just trying to implore people toward a friendly toward, – toward love rather than force? Uh, well, both actually. Uh, I, I am angry at the state. I think uh, it, it, it consists of a lot of people who are committing crimes and they're hurting a lot of people by doing so. Uh, you know, when you think about what a great world it could be <laughs> if we didn't have these crimes being committed, if we didn't have, for example, so many government measures to hold down the poor. You know, minimum wage laws, licensing regulations, public schools, public schools. It just goes on and on and on. Uh, we, we we really couldn't even have a poverty problem in a country like the United States if it weren't for public policy. There are too many ways in which people could get out of poverty and would. But not only not only do these policies keep them in poverty, but. These policies corrupt them. They, they, they make them think they deserve handouts. They make them think that, that people owe them something. You know, the, these are the kinds of beliefs that, say, 100 years ago or more, when immigrants came to the United States, they didn't come here thinking, oh, the people that are over there owe me something. They just wanted a chance to work. Do you ever think that you might be the, the – Utopian about what freedom can do versus government. I think that there still would be problems in freedom. We'd, people sure. would still be poor. We yeah. we'd have to give an actual yeah. accurate no, assessment. No, no, no. I'm not utopian. I know that any world with human beings in it will have trouble. Okay, that's the nature of the raw material. Some of us are no damn good. Okay, uh, so I certainly do not believe that a a, a abolition of government as we know it would bring about some kind of heaven on earth. But it would it would be vastly better than the world we live in, infused by state power. And, and the way in which problems were dealt with would be very different too. There wouldn't be, for example, people punished for victimless crimes. And if you look at our world, Punishment of people for victimless crimes is almost like name of the game. You know, as a, Jeff Tucker wrote a piece just a few days ago about about what goes on in traffic court every day. It's just robbery. You bring in there all these people one after another who haven't hurt anyone. 
that make they haven't better. violated yeah. anyone's just rights, and they're just being ripped off altogether. Thousands of dollars. You know that what happened out there by St. Louis and the, that suburb. You know, it was very much tied to the fact that those those little suburban governments live off stealing from people through through giving traffic tickets to people and hauling them into court on all kinds of stupid pretexts. Uh, so the you know, robber barons are not things that go back to the Middle Ages. We have robber barons all over this country. Whole local governments, whole police departments live off robbery, outright robbery. It's not just you know the fact that all taxation is robbery. It's a it's it's blatant robbery. Uh, you know, p- 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 people talk about oh in Mexico if a policeman stops you, you know he's looking for a bribe. Well, sometimes he is. But what do you think is happening here? It's a much more elaborate system of extracting your money. It's it's no more decent in any way than that poor, you know, ill-paid Mexican cop who wants 100 pesos to let you off. Uh, but people don't understand it. They accept that it's the law. It's the rules, blah, blah, blah. That's crap. It's robbery. That's all it is. And and I, I wish people would come to see it as that more than they do, because this is the kind of thing where something might be done. This isn't like you have to overthrow Congress or, you know, replace the president or anything. It's just you you got to go to city council and say, you bastards better stop this or we're voting your, your butts all out of office. One of the really distressing things about government and particularly powerful governments and big governments is, I mean, we, we can go to the city council and we can – tell them we'll vote them out but we're often in the minority and even if we can get a group of people together, these things are so big and so entrenched that the amount of control, the amount of say we have over it is vanishingly small. Um, what can those of us who recognize the immorality of a lot of this um, and see the system for what it really is, is there anything that we can do in our daily lives? to move the needle, to shift things more towards not that utopian world but the a better world? I think there are a lot of things that can be done. Uh, many things can be done in the form of opting out or you know, relocating yourself, adjusting somehow how you live, where you live, uh, what you do. Um, people don't very often at least think about their lives in that way. They don't think when they think, where will I live? What job will I pursue? They don't think about, you know, well, how exposed am I to, to the evils of the state? But when you can get them to thinking that way, they often find there are a lot of things they can do to evade, avoid, lower the risks, um, and when they do that, they, in a sense, become believers uh, who can sort of talk to their friends, relatives, and neighbors and say, look, you don't have to put up with this stuff. You, you make a missionary out of them, as it were, <laughs> as soon as they discover that they can escape some of the abuse. Uh, I know friends, I have good personal friends who they don't get involved in uh, – libertarian activities or groups or anything like that. But they live their lives in a way that that is uh, constructed to to maximize their actual freedom and avoid government abuse uh, to 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 uh, make their tax bill as small as possible, to make their exposure to government regulation as small as possible, uh, to do all sorts of things that are within the grasp of most people if they thought about working toward that. So there are ways of opting out. I mentioned in my my uh, talk earlier today homeschooling, which has been tremendously successful in, in removing about 10 percent of the children in the country from the horrors of the government schools. And uh, there's plenty more room for homeschooling or for for private schooling. And I think a lot of people are 
are dissuaded from doing homeschooling or private schooling by the expenses and by the time demands and, and by feeling they're not qualified. But I, I think, you know, if you can get people to thinking about just how bad it's going to be in the public schools, you know, the public schools now are like prisons, literally. In some areas. You go through, you go through metal detectors. There are, there are security people in the corridors. Uh, you know, would you want to send your child to a place like that every day? It's like, you know, okay, Sonny, it's time to put your six hours in the city jail. Uh, off you go. Have a good day. Uh, I don't know why pe- people do this, uh, except that it's just inconvenient to pursue the alternative. But, but the truth is, when, when you get started, you get a critical mass. It's not as hard as you think. Uh, we've homeschooled our kids, uh, my stepkids that I have, and uh, uh, the the homeschoolers get together and cooperate with each other in so many ways that people aren't aware of to to give certain classes to the kids to to give activities to them to to really flesh out a nice educational experience. It's not that every day they're you got to have six hours of class time, as it were, with with mom or dad sitting there working with the kids. Uh, and there's a lot of online stuff you can do now, uh, tremendous resources for that. Uh, CDs, you know, you name it. It's just all sorts of things that homeschoolers can do. And, and, and when they do that, they they take their children out of the control of these wicked school authorities who are, are in some ways the most irresponsible people I can think of. They're, they're just sick with the idea of following rules, no matter how much sense they make. A lot of them are just, are just stupidly PC. Uh, they, 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 they ram ideas about the environment and, and all, all sorts of discrimination and what have you down the, throats of the kids and uh, and of course you know kids are not as easy as people might think you know if if a kid has a brain in his head by the time he's eight he begins to see what's being done to him to some extent but not all of them and a lot of them just end up being affected by what's done to them in the government schools and well that makes me think of this the question that reflects a bunch of these ideas which is what is worse, competent government, highly competent government that's really good at accomplishing its goals how, no matter how nefarious they might be or incompetent government, ones that would fail in the process of trying to accomplish their goals? Well, sir, certainly incompetence is better in many, many departments of government. Uh, unfortunately, in some cases you know, where you really would love incompetence like the police, the incompetence becomes fatal. You know, they they send the SWAT team to the wrong address very often, for example. So it's you really wish they'd been more competent at a time like that. Even though I don't I don't want them going to anybody's address to serve a warrant. But you'd like the NSA to be less competent. Is or, or, oh uh, yeah, absolutely. I'd like them to be utterly incompetent. <laughs> you know, uh, they just hear static when they plugged in. Uh, if it were up to me. So do you do you think things are? Do you have any optimism at all or do you think things are, are just kind of circling the drain? Um, well, th- there's always hope. You know, Sometimes people listen to me and they say, this guy has no hope. That's not true. There's always hope. We're alive. We still got brains in our head. We may wake up and do something someday. It's not inconceivable. Uh, but what are the odds? I think the odds are not good. Uh, One gentleman in my talk today was pointing out all the positive trends uh, about life expectancies and and wealth and what have you. And there's no gainsaying that uh, the United States and other advanced welfare warfare states are wealthy. Uh, People have a high level of living. Uh, They're constantly entertained. Uh, they have marvelous electronic toys. You know, everybody from four years old up has a smartphone now, and uh, and so yeah, it looks it looks wonderful in in some ways, but on the other hand, it's a police state, and the police state part of it 
gets worse every day. And it doesn't seem to matter what anybody says about it. It's as if all the protest is just part of the ritual dance. You even have members of Congress. They, they, you know, they stand up and they make a speech or they go in and, and introduce a bill or something. But what is different? What has the NSA stopped doing? I think it started doing a lot more in the past 10 years than it stopped doing. So I, I, I really do believe that there's a, there's a part of government, and this is the heart of it, the war, in, intelligence, foreign policy part, that really runs on its own power, that it's really not under effective control. I wonder sometimes even how much control the president of the United States has over some of these people, because what can he do? If he issued an order to the head of the NSA, how's he going to know if that order was really carried out? Of course, the guy will say, yes, sir, yes, sir, but maybe he won't do anything. And how's the president going to know? He's not a techno genius, and he's got other things to do. He's got a golf game. Uh, so things could get better, but life than not, does it? Well, that's that's the short term uh, view I hold uh, in this country. There are parts of the world where things are getting better in most ways. Uh, and that's glorious. You know, the fact that that China went from being a centrally planned communist country to being a, a, a semi open fascist country. That was a huge improvement for hundreds of millions of people. That one change probably did more to improve human well-being than any other single thing we can think of. Look, just the numbers of people it benefited. People don't have famines anymore in China. What a glorious thing. They used to starve by the scores of millions when they had a famine. They had them every once in a while. Same in India. India's not having famines anymore. They've got the technology to avoid that. Uh, so, yeah, things are getting much better in some ways. It, has anybody created a free society? Hell no. Not even close. Are, are, are most of the advanced countries moving in the wrong direction? Yes. Their freedoms are diminishing rather than increasing. Uh, and it's not that it's all one way. There's Mixed picture all the time. Some things go worse. Some things get better. But you have to evaluate the overall picture and you have to decide what's important to you. Is it important that you have more electronic toys or is it important that, that, that you not have cops breaking into people's houses with hand grenades to serve warrants? So to me, I don't want to live in a police state. Uh, and, if, and if I have to go somewhere and live in relatively primitive conditions... To, that's an improvement for me. Uh, I, I don't think many people would like it. They wouldn't consider it an improvement. And I'm sorry they don't because that's, that's the crux of the thing. At ground level, it's the fact that people don't love liberty very much. And when they have to pay a price for it, they won't pay much. Uh, and until that changes, it's hard to see how we can ever have a much freer world. Thank you for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.